hugs this morning. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. may be seated. Again, welcome to BCC, the Lighthouse of Hope. We're so glad you're here. Um, Pastor Mike and, and Miss Connie, they are in Florida with their family, and so we're going to be praying for them. We're also going to be praying for the Stevensons. Uh, they're taking a group to Houston this week, um, so they're, they're going to go down there and, and be of assistance. And then today, if you want to be of assistance, uh, we're having the blood drive. I believe we have close to 20 people signed up, and so there's plenty of spots for walk-ins. If you want to go over there during the service or in between Sunday school or something like that, spots are available, and I hear you get some snacks and treats. So, And a t-shirt. That's right. That's right. That's exactly right. Well, let me pray, and we'll continue to pour out our praise this morning. God... Thank you so much for today. God, thank you that you're a God of love. Thank you that you're a God of, of truth and of grace. And Lord, we just pray that you would meet us here in, in this place. Lord, a lot of us are coming in here. We've had hard weeks or we've had certain anxieties. But Lord, we know that you carry all burdens. And we need to just come to you knowing that, um, Lord, your shoulders are broad. And Lord, you'll, you'll meet us where we're at. So I, I pray against any kind of distraction this morning. I pray that we'd be focused on you, and I pray that we would leave here transformed. Lord, we pray as you taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If you would, please stand. Amen. Let us stand to sing today about the love of God, the power of God, the mercy of God that reigns on each and every one of us. Love that's never failing Let mercy fall on me And everyone needs forgiveness The kindness of a Savior The hope of a nation Savior he can move the mountain. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. 
the author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. So take me as you find me, all my fears and failures, and feel my life again. I give my life to follow everything I believe in. And now I surrender. And now I surrender. Oh, Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. The author of salvation, he rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Savior. He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. The author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. The author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. He can move the mountains. The song that says, higher than the mountains that I face, stronger than the power of the grave, constant in the trial and the change. One thing remains, and that's your love never fails. It never gives up, and it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love. And higher than the mountains that I face, stronger than the power of the grave, and constant in the trial and the change. One thing remains. One thing remains. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love. And on and on and on and on it goes. It all
never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up. It never runs out on me, your love. And on and on and on and on it goes. It overwhelms and satisfies my soul. And I never ever have to be afraid. So on. It never runs out on me. Your love never fails. It never gives up. It never runs out on me. Your love never fails. It never gives up. It never runs out on me. Your love. In death, in life, I'm confident and covered by. It never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love. I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard tender whisper of love in the dead of night. Can you tell me that you're pleasing that I'm never alone? You're a good Searching for answers far and wide. I know we're all searching for answers, only you provide. I know what we need before we say a word. You're a good, good part. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are Oh, 
is definitely good is there anybody in here that doesn't mind praising the lord nobody that doesn't mind just thanking him for who he is thanking him for all that he has done we serve a good good father he is so good to us and it is good for us to call upon his name and that's what we want to do right now we want to call upon the name of the lord and i want to encourage you to do something as i'm praying whatever's on your heart i I want, I want you to make sure you're putting that petition before the Lord this morning, truly calling upon the name of the Lord. Is there anybody in here besides me that stands in the need of prayer? Amen. Just standing in the need of prayer. Join hands with your neighbors as we go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Our Father and our God, we pause yet again, Lord, to say thank you. We thank you, O oh God, for this day, Lord, a day that was not promised to any of us, Lord. But for that, Lord, we are truly thankful. We're thankful, O oh God, that you are an all-wise, all-knowing, all-powerful God. We're humbled by the fact you allow us to be your children, Lord. And Father, we come to your throne of grace this morning in the mighty and most matchless name of Jesus, Lord, asking, Lord, that you would forgive us of our sins, Lord. You would strengthen us where we are weak, Lord. Father, create in us clean hearts and renew right spirits within us this morning, Lord. Lord God, no matter what it is that we're going through, we want to stand on your word and the promise of your word, Lord, that you would never leave us or forsake us, Father. So I pray right now, Father, that those under the sound of my voice, Lord God, would truly take their burdens under you this morning, Lord God, and leave them there. Lord, let us leave it in your hands, for you know what to do with it, Father. Father, give us strength to endure this morning, Lord. Lord, where there are heavy hearts, I pray that you would lift those burdens. Lord, Lord, where there's anxiety, Father, I pray right now that you would remove that. I pray that there would be a total release from us, Lord, to cast our cares upon you for you care for us, Lord. I pray that we would have the mind to not be anxious for anything, but through all things, things through prayer and supplication, Lord, we would make our requests known to you this morning, Father. Father God, we thank you so much for all that you've done. We thank you for what you're doing, Lord. We thank you that we have this holy tabernacle to come into, Lord God, to lift up holy hands, to lay our burdens down, to hear your preached word, Father. And it is my prayer, Lord, that we would leave this place different than we came into it, Father. Father God, that we would have a mind to go and tell this dying world what must they do to be saved, Lord. That we would go and tell this dying world that we serve a true and risen God. That we would be unashamed of the gospel, Lord God. Lord, that we would know and understand, Lord, that it is you who created us and not we ourselves, Lord. Father God, we thank you so much for all that is you. We thank you that we have this place to come into and worship with our brothers and our sisters, Lord God, from all walks of life. But Father, I pray, Lord, that as we leave this place, we would continue to have that mind to interact and engage with folks from all walks of life, saved and unsaved, Lord God. Lord, that we would be the light that shines in this dark world, Lord. Lord, that we would be your ambassadors wherever we go that we would know and understand that we have a charge, Lord God, to keep and a God to glorify, Father. And I pray that we would do that with everything that we do. Father God, I pray for those that are in our congregation that are going through tough times, that are dealing with illnesses, Lord. I lift them up to you. I pray healing upon those bodies, Lord. I pray, Lord, in the midst of it, that they would be drawn closer to you and that they would know and understand, Lord, that you are always, you are perpetually with us, Lord. We thank you so much for what you've done for us. We ask, oh God, that you, you and you alone, Lord, would be the focal point of all that we say, all that we do in here, so that your name gets glory. Father, help us to realize that it's not about us. It's all about you. We ask these things in the name of Jesus and all of God's people said, amen. Amen. Good morning. 
uh, if you were here last week, uh, maybe in second service, or maybe you've seen uh, pictures, but my son, Elias, uh, five years old, he was baptized last week. And all week, um, he has been talking about communion. When I left the house this morning, I told everybody, hey, love you guys. We'll see you at church. Elias says, I'll see you at communion. So I think we should all be that excited about coming uh, and partaking in communion with our God, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Um, in, in the Bible, you'll notice, uh, especially in the Gospels, uh, you'll notice kind of a pattern that Jesus repeatedly says that, hey, what I am doing is what I have seen my father do. Uh, and last week, we saw a picture of that. Was, Man, I had the honor and the privilege of being able to baptize my own son. I and mean, then, like I said last week, I wish every parent could feel what I felt uh, during that moment. Um, I only cried like eight times last Sunday, uh, so it's no big deal. But I wish every parent could feel that. Uh, but my son, uh, his faith in Jesus is a mirror of my faith in Jesus because, and my wife, but what he has seen us do, uh, he, he saw value in that, and he has placed his hope and his trust in Jesus as well. And so Jesus says in John's gospel, he says in chapter 5, verse 18, uh, it reads, Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him, because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the Father do. But whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. In verse 21, he says, As the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father has done, the Son has done also. And there is life this morning. Uh, that's why we come to this table to celebrate the life that God has provided for us through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, the bread represents his body. That was on that cross, it was broken for us. And the juice represents his shed blood uh, for the remission of our sins. It offers cleansing from all unrighteousness. That is what it celebrates this morning. So we should be excited about this part of our service, about all of the service, really. But as we reflect upon this and we remember the death of Christ, we proclaim until he returns. Amen? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. As we come to this table, we're reminded of how much you love us, that you sent your one and only Son to die on the cross for our sins. Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. It is in Jesus' wonderful name that we pray. Amen.
Heavenly Father, we are so richly blessed by you. Lord, we, uh, we come here as a blessed, as a blessed nation. And Lord, we come here to your foot of this cross, blessed by your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Every day, these blessings you give to us, we just return those first fruits to you, Lord. We give thanks for the things that you do, the talents that you give us. We do them all unto you and in your will. In your son's name we pray. Amen. I forgot to announce earlier, um, Trunk or Treat is this Wednesday, so we're going to have a ton of kids around here. I know Linda is looking for some people to pack out their trunks full of candy, so that's going to be a couple hours this Wednesday, and you can see her about uh, sign-ups. Today, while Pastor Mike is out, I thought I would concentrate on relationships. Uh, usually when I'm up here, I like to talk about discipling and mentoring relationships. But today I want to focus on peer relationships. The title of the sermon today is A Mighty Crew. We're going to look at a couple of gentlemen and see how their authentic communities help them to achieve God's purpose in their lives. First, I'm going to start with William Wilberforce. Uh, hopefully, a lot of you are familiar with him and how he impacted our world. Um, if you're not familiar, I'm going to give you a little synopsis of his life. He was born in 1759 into a wealthy family of merchant traders in England. Because of his wealth, he was able to go to a variety of good schools, including Cambridge. Not too shabby. Cambridge is a uh, prestigious place. At the young age of 24, he was elected into Parliament. 24 years old. When a lot of us were living with our parents at 24, he was helped running the country. And he was a force to be reckoned with while he was there. He helped reform child labor laws, uh, reform prisons. He even worked on the, the behalf of mistreated animals. On a personal note, over his life, he founded and supported over 60 charities. However, Wilberforce is most famous for helping to abolish slavery in England, which is no small feat. I mean, you can imagine in the 18th century, slavery was a booming business in uh, Britain and in America. It was estimated that two million African slaves were shipped across the Atlantic to America in the triangular trade. Uh, British uh, ships would send slaves to America, the slaves would work, and usually in return, the Brits would receive sugar. Many people banked on the horrors of slavery. It was ingrained in the culture. As a result, Wilberforce had no chance to abolish slavery on his own, anyway. Thankfully, he did have some help. He rolled with people like Henry Thornton, a financial genius, a banker, also a member of Parliament. He's one of those pictures up there. I can't read the names, but those are some of the guys he rolled with. One of them is Zachary Macaulay, a walking encyclopedia. He was a master of research, so if Wilberforce ever needed any facts or figures, Macaulay was his man. Olada Kiwanu, he was an ex-slave who gave much insight into the workings of slavery. He wrote a, a, a great book that circulated throughout England and really helped people see what slavery was like. Along with Olada, Granville Sharp was one of the prime movers in the abolitionist cause. Hannah Moore was in the middle of the literary world as a writer, uh, excuse me, as a writer and social reformer. She also brought light to the horrors of slavery. And it didn't hurt that Wilberforce was buddies uh, college buddies, uh, just lifelong buddies with the Prime Minister, William Pitt. These are just a few names of people that were in Wilberforce's peer group. And what's neat about this crew is that many of these cohorts live together in Clapham. Clapham is a quaint suburb of London. Several lived in close proximity so that they could grow to, together spiritually. In fact, a lot of them were to go to church twice a week together just so they can keep the right perspective. The church is still there today, the Holy Trinity Church. Clapham was a place where these reformers could plan, where they could dream together, where they could be consoled. Lord knows they need a lot, a lot of consoling. 
they needed encouragement as they sought to end this huge massive thing called slavery and to reform society. Uh, it, it was a rough place in England in the 18th century. It's estimated that one in four women were prostitutes. So just a lot of immorality going on. This group of roughly 17, they were known as the Clapham Sect or Circle. And one person who was particularly helpful in this sect was John Newton. And you, John, you know John Newton whether you realize it or not. Uh, Newton is the infamous sea captain who wrote the song Amazing Grace. We've all sang that song. He wrote it to describe his experience on his slave ship. Eventually, he did denounce his former life after he came to God. He became a clergyman in England. He also knew Wilberforce when William was a young lad, when William faithfully followed God. We also know that he kept tabs on Wilberforce at Cambridge when William turned away from God. That was a time where he kind of sold his, uh, his wild wheat, or his wild oats, I should say. Um, got into gambling, got into drinking. He didn't have time for religion. Newton once wrote a friend, the strongest and most promising religious convictions I ever met with were in the case of Mr. Wilberforce when he was a boy. But they now seem entirely worn off. Not a trace left behind except a deportment comparatively decent and moral in a young man of a large fortune. Wilberforce's religious convictions did eventually return in 1786, two years after being in Parliament. He was 26. He was having uh, struggles with doubt, feelings of guilt, and he came to a point of putting his trust in Jesus. He realized Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, as we just prayed earlier. He later journaled, in God's infinite love, Christ had died to save such a sinner and I found the beginning of gospel comfort. I love how he says that. I found the beginning of gospel comfort. And he did find his comfort. He found peace. He found freedom. But at the same time, he was in turmoil about whether he should stay in politics or not. Parliament was a dirty, corrupt place. It, it mirrored what London was like as a whole. I know it's hard for us in America to imagine such a place, such an institution of corruption, a dirty place, but that's what he was in. He was torn. In his mind, it's either I got to choose God or I got to choose politics. Apparently, he kept tabs on Newton as well because he eventually sought out uh, Newton's advice on this dilemma. Newton replied wisely, God has raised you up for the good of his church and the good of the nation. His words sounding much like Mordecai's words to Esther. Maybe God has raised you up for a time as this. Newton's words, they rang true. Wilberforce stayed in Parliament, and the rest is history. Slavery was abolished in 1833, 46 years after the first push by Wilberforce. 46 years. Wilberforce was definitely a key player in the abolishment of slavery, but there's no way he could have done it alone. He had a mighty crew of men and women who lived in authentic community together. They fought beside each other to rid England of this darkness. And if you're interested in learning more about this, you can learn all about Wilberforce and the Clapham Circle uh, by reading the book Amazing Grace or watching the movie. Hopefully you've seen the movie. It was released in 2007, and I think it did great justice to his life and all those who fought slavery. With the rest of the morning, though, I want to focus on 2 Samuel 23. We're going to look at another group of mighty men, and uh, they're David's mighty men. As you're opening your Bibles to 2 Samuel 23, I'll give you a little bit of context. In the beginning of the chapter, uh, David gives a poetic discourse at the end of his life. Then the prophet Samuel gives us some insight into David's mighty men, starting in verse 8. Um, in this whole section, we're going to see a list of 37 men. Another list can be found in 1 Chronicles, 1, or 1 Chronicles 11. So if you want to check out uh, more of these names, 1 Chronicles 11. It is similar. Um, it's not exactly the same because in 1 Chronicles, 16 more names are added, probably due to the fact that some of these mighty men died in battle. So David needed replacements. 
Now, regardless of the number of mighty men, though, one thing is important to note. Out of 600 men that rallied to David in the desert, David had a core group. He had peers. Uh, he had chief warriors who stuck by him as King Saul sought to end his life. In verse 8, I won't read um, until we probably get to uh, verse 13, but I'll just give you an overview. Verse 8, we learn about Joshab Bashabeth. He raised his spear against hundreds of enemy warriors in one encounter in one single-handedly. A miracle. Then there's Eleazar in verse 9. He fought with David often in, in one particular battle with the Philistines. The Philistines were winning. Some of the Israelites retreated. Not Eleazar. He stood his ground until, verse 10 tells us, his hand grew tired and froze to the sword. I don't even know how that happens. But that's how hard he was fighting. Benaiah was also a mighty warrior. We read about him in verse 20. This dude was hardcore. He struck down warriors from Moab, Egypt, and if that's not enough, he went into a pit on a snowy day and killed a lion. How about that? No wonder he was David's bodyguard while they were in the desert. In fact, you know, that should probably be a prerequisite for our security guys, right? If you want to be um, in the, the secret service, you got to go and kill a lion. That will separate the weaklings, right? These are the kind of men that David is fighting with. They're fierce warriors. They're loyal. Uh, most, if not all of them, love David dearly. And I'm going to prove it to you this morning. We're going to pick up in verse 13 of 2 Samuel 23. During harvest time, three of the 30 chief warriors came down to David at the cave of Adul, while a band of Philistines were encamped in the valley of Rephaim. At that time, God was, or excuse me, David was in the stronghold, and the Philistine garrison was at Bethlehem. David longed for water and said, Oh, that someone would get me a drink of water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem. So the three mighty warriors broke through the Philistine lines drew water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem and carried it back to David. But he refused to drink it. Instead, he poured it out before the Lord. Far be it from me, Lord, to do this, he said. Is it not the blood of men who went at the risk of their lives? And David would not drink it. Such were the exploits of the three mighty warriors. I love this passage. We, we got to break it down so that we grasp as much as we can from this. Uh, it is harvest time. It's probably a time when it's hot and dry there in Israel. David is hanging out in the cave of Adullam, which is 13 miles to the south and west of Bethlehem. Now remember, David is from Bethlehem. Since he's parched, his mind automatically recalls that fresh water from the well at the gate. The well that is still there in Bethlehem today, you can still see it. And we know this craving. We, we've all been parched. We've all longed for fresh water. Uh, my wife, uh, before she had uh, Francie, every day she craved a 38 cent large ice water with extra ice from Sonic. Every day. There's just something about Sonic ice water. And if you've been to Sonic, they, ha they do have the best ice. Some watering holes are just better than others. And David longed for this familiar fresh water in his favorite system. So he thought out loud, oh, that someone would get me a drink of water from that well near the gate of Bethlehem. I love the fact that these three guys, we don't know who they are, but these three mighty warriors, they were close enough to David to know his need. And they had enough compassion to do something about it. As I thought about that, it's convicting because a lot of times I don't want to get too close to people, even those I, I love because when you're close to people, needs are going to come up and you may feel compelled to act. Um, these guys, they felt compelled and they willingly, willingly did something about it. They traveled 13 miles. They broke through enemy lines. We don't know if they fought anybody or not, but they broke through the lines, risked their life and then traveled 13 miles back. They weren't ordered to do this, mind you. They did it out of compassion. They did it to serve their leader. And what did David do? We would have chugged that water, right? 
David, he refused to drink it and he poured it out. Now imagine you're these mighty men. You just traveled 26 total miles for your life at risk. How are you going to respond? You'd be shocked, right? Well, I don't think this is a slap in the face um, as, as we might think. Um, this is actually an act of worship. And we're clued into this in verse 16. Verse 16. Uh, David poured out the water before the Lord, and he said, Far be it from me, Lord, to do this. Is it not the blood of men who went at the risk of their lives? David poured out the water as a drink offering to the Lord. Drink offerings are a foreign concept to us today, but a drink offering is very much, or was very much, a part of ancient Israel. We first see the first uh, drink offering in Genesis 35. God spoke to Jacob at Bethel and reaffirmed his covenant with Jacob, and then he changed his name to Israel. In response, we're told in verse 14, Jacob set up a stone pillar at the place where God talked with him, and he poured out a drink offering on him. So from the beginning, in Genesis, we see a drink offering. After Jacob died, the people of Israel continued to pour out drink offerings on their burnt offerings and grain offerings. Uh, we see some specifications in Exodus 29, in Numbers 15. For instance, Moses told the Hebrews in Numbers 15, verse 4 and 5, one quarter hen of wine, which a hen, it's a form of measurement, it's about one quart. One quarter hen of wine was poured out into the altar fire for each lamb sacrifice. There's many verses in the Old Testament that speak to uh, drink offerings. But basically, as you research, you learn very quickly that a drink offering is a ritual that represented joy and celebration. The ancient Israelites brought drink offerings out of their thankfulness for God's faithfulness and his provision. Again, think back to Jacob. Jacob heard from God. He had this encounter. The covenant was reconfirmed. And out of joy, out of celebration, Jacob poured out a drink offering. This is what David was doing. He was saying, fellas, I value your sacrifice so much, so much, I can't enjoy it in the flesh. God deserves this kind of devotion. Let's celebrate him. Let's, let's give him the glory and honor from this. Can you relate with David? Have you ever been served in such a way that you cannot help but worship God? Lacey and I are so blessed to be a part of this body. We, we get blessed all the time with, with other people's time, with their service uh, financially. Um, last last uh, week, actually the week before, we were best, blessed tremendously. Uh, Lacey and I were so blown away. We couldn't believe that this lady would do this for us, this thing. Um, so I, I felt guilty. I was like, I, I don't deserve this. Uh, we need to give this away. We need to, to bless others with this. Maybe you've had a dinner bill paid for. Maybe you've had a meal served to you while you were sick. Um, and you just thought to yourself, man, I, I got to pay this for. That's, that's natural for us as humans. When we experience generosity, it's natural for us to want to pay it for. And I, I imagine this was the case with David. Moreover, I presume these three mighty men were blessed by David's offerings. See what a great little passage that is? See how much we can glean just from that short bit? Samuel goes on to list the rest of the mighty men in 2 Samuel 23, starting in verse 24. Um, you can read these names on your own and butcher them like I most definitely would <laughs> if I read them. Uh, but I encourage you to read the names, go through them. It's tempting to skip over names like this, a long list. It's tempting to skip over genealogies. Uh, we think, what's the point? Uh, this, is, this is a bunch of names that I can't pronounce. Well, folks, there is a point. Everything in the Bible has a point. It's living and active, all right? There's a reason. It helps me to think about a graduation ceremony. Yes, it's a dread to listen, to read the names of hundreds of students who are gonna be walking across the stage. Nonetheless, what do we do as soon as our loved ones walk on the stage? We scream, we shout, we, we blow the horns, right? Because certain names mean something to us. 
Amaya, Dasari, the Ocean, Summer, Panna, Jamichael, Braxton, Trudell, Jalon, Charlie. These are seniors that mean something to us. And when they walk in May, in May we're going to be excited for them. Why? Because their names mean something to us. In the same way, the Vietnam Memorial in Washington, D.C. means something. People may walk along the memorial and not give much thought to the 58,000 names printed on the black granite. Yet there are countless others who will walk by that wall, and they're in awe as they think about the sacrifices, as they think about the faithfulness of those soldiers. David's mighty men were faithful. Despite the pressure, despite the persecutions they faced, they were faithful. Consequently, God remembers their names. Their names mean something to God. And folks, that's a great reminder to us. God remembers faithfulness. Even if no one cares about your name on this earth, if you are faithful, God will remember your faithfulness. And he wants us to remember these mighty men of David. This brings me to the challenge this morning. Be encompassed by a mighty crew. Wilberforce brought justice to the world with the help of a mighty crew. David was a faithful man. He was Israel's greatest king, but he couldn't have done it alone. He couldn't have fought alone. He couldn't have strategized alone. He couldn't have overcome the consequences of sin alone. We all remember Bathsheba. He committed adultery with Bathsheba and had her husband Uriah killed. Well, who's Uriah? Uriah was one of David's mighty men that we read about in 2 Samuel. Do you think he overcame that alone? No way. David had many mighty people around him to help him succeed. So my question for us this morning is, who are your mighty people? Who are your mighty people? Who are those who will stick with you in the trenches of life and encourage you and sharpen you as you seek to bring God's glory to this earth? Who are those people? I know I give Trey a hard time um, often up here, but he's actually one of my mighty men. Don't tell him I said that. But he's one of my mighty men. We get together uh, at least twice a month to share our struggles, to share our successes. We try to share that last 10%. You know, a lot of us will share 90% of the truth, we'll share 90% of our lives, but we don't want to get too deep with many people. Try and, Trey and I, we try to share. We confess to one another because James 5.16 says, confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another so that you may be healed. We try to take that seriously. We, we try to be intentional. We try to hold each other accountable because we know Satan loves nothing more than for us to be isolated. That's when it's easiest for us to be devoured, when we're off on our own. So we try to combat that by sharing life together. Do you have people like this in your life? Do you have mighty people? If so, I encourage you on the back of your bullets and to write some of those names. Um, just as a reminder to those people who are in your corner, uh, as a reminder to those who will be there for you, um, maybe you need to rekindle some of those relationships. Who are those mighty people in your life? If you have some intentional relationships, that's awesome. Um, if not, I encourage you this morning to pray for a mighty crew. And if you have a mighty crew, I encourage you to think about who needs a mighty person in their life. There's probably somebody around you that is in a desert place and they need your faithfulness. They need your loyalty. Our mission as Christians is to love God, love people. Our, our command is to make disciples. If we follow those commands, if you follow those commands, you will need a crew. You will have to have a crew. It's impossible to do it alone. You need a crew because God is going to open your eyes to needs around you. Just like he did with the three mighty men. He's going to open your eyes and you're going to realize your need to make disciples. The harvest is plentiful. And as you go out and make disciples, God may put it on your heart to free people of slavery. There's still tens of millions of people that are in slavery today. Some estimate there's more slaves today than at any other point in history. God may put on your heart to bring fresh water, clean water to those who don't have it. Thousands upon thousands are dying daily because they don't have a well like David's. They don't have clean water. 
God may call you to this. Whatever your cause, whatever he points you towards, it's virtually impossible to do it alone. Whatever your pursuit, change happens at the speed of relationship. Let me say that again. Change happens at the speed of relationships. Wilberforce slowly developed relationships over 46 years. He, he shared his story with people. He got to know people. He allowed people in. And eventually the word spread. As they saw this tight-knit community, as they saw the love and concern, as they read about the horrors and heard about the horrors of slavery, eventually the tide turned and slavery was abolished. Folks, it's all about relationships. You can't make disciples alone. You can't fight injustice alone. We need a crew. It's all about relationships. And the most important relationship you can have is one with Jesus. You can't begin to change the world if you don't first let Jesus change you. Change you. It's imperative. And I know that's, that's scary. I don't want God to change me. I, I'm doing pretty good. I, I'm living a life of comfort. I'm doing what I want to do. Some of us think, I can't do that. Well, folks, it is so worth it. Jesus poured out his blood as the ultimate blood sacrifice, as the ultimate drink offering for you so that you could be reconciled to God. If you truly believe in his gift, you can be reconnected with him. And you know what? When you're connected with God, He's going to give you the fruit of the Spirit. He's going to give you love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness, faithfulness, uh, self-control. He's going to give you these things so that you can in turn go and make an impact on the world. He'll fill you up. He'll give you what you need so you can pour yourself out. Maybe this morning you don't have that connection with Jesus. And maybe this morning you need to know of gospel comfort, that gospel comfort that Will before us talked about. Here in a second, I'm going to ask you to stand, and we're going to uh, have an open invitation for you to get that relationship right with God first and foremost. That's the start. If you have made a decision, if you are connected with God, then I encourage you to really think about those mighty people. Think about who you can pour into. Think about those who are pouring into you. And let's huddle up. We gotta huddle up so that we can bring life to this world. All right? So if you would, please stand. And we're gonna sing this song of invitation. The altar is also open here at the front. If you just need to come and pray, if you're in a desert place, uh, just come. God, thank you so much for this day. Lord, thank you that you're a God of all comfort. Lord, you satisfy our deepest needs, our deepest concerns, Lord. Um, we're so thankful that we can be in a relationship with you. And we just pray that as a result of your love for us, that it would just outflow into this world. Uh, Lord, we just pray that you would continue to surround us with, with people that can spur us on, people who can share the hard truth with us. 
so that we don't get off track, so that we remember we're only here a short time, and Lord, we're on mission. As your ambassadors, we're called to bring truth to this world, to bring love to this world. So I pray that you would put a burden on our hearts for those around us, and I pray that you would put people in our lives that will help us. Lord, we give you all the praise, and we love you so much in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.